How to perfect your telephone technique. Telephone technique is of the utmost importance to the success of your doctor's practice. It is the first contact that most of the patients have with you and your office, and a good first impression is so valuable it is almost immeasurable. This record shows you ways to perfect your telephone technique. The telephone is a mechanical instrument permitting person-to-person -person contact between you and the caller. But always remember that you are talking with a real person. Although you may think that only your voice is being transmitted, actually your entire attitude and manner will be conveyed. No memorized phrases will substitute for the realization and conviction that you are representing a profession with a definite ability to serve sick people. And the caller is one whom your doctor may be able to restore to health. To help you achieve maximum results from your telephone communications with minimum effort, we have outlined on this record certain attitudes, procedures, and phraseologies which should be incorporated as part of your office personality in order to perfect your telephone technique. These techniques are designed to get the patient inside the door of your doctor's office for consultation. Therefore, the first objective in telephone technique is to make an appointment. The key thought to keep in mind as you talk with a prospective patient is to remove fear of the unknown in his or her mind. You can accomplish this by describing the procedure which the caller will encounter when coming into the office of a chiropractor for a consultation. Therefore, it is your responsibility to make your doctor's office and its service sound both inviting and helpful to the prospective patient. This is a vital role that you play. Tact and diplomacy are especially necessary on the telephone. This instrument is your contact with the general public. Many people will be hesitant but also curious as to just what chiropractic is and what it can do. First impressions are lasting and many new patients can be brought in to be helped or driven away by the telephone technique you use in talking with them the first time. It has been discovered that if a person actually smiles while talking on the telephone, the tone of her voice and the conversation itself will be warm and friendly. Always answer the telephone in a pleasant, courteous manner that indicates genuine interest to the caller and smile as you pick up the receiver. Always remember that the success of your conversation is often determined before you actually say anything to the person over the telephone. There are both mechanical and mental arrangements to be made. For instance, the CA's telephone should be close at hand on her desk. A pencil and pad for messages must be available at all times, perhaps attached to the base of the telephone. Since busy signals are quite annoying to the call, your own personal conversation should be strictly limited. If you have an unlisted telephone, always use it for all outgoing calls. If the telephone is in use more than about one-sixth of your office hour's time, you should have two lines, preferably on a rotary system. When you answer the telephone, let your personality shine. Your voice must convey by telephone what you would ordinarily express face-to-face -face by gestures, the twinkle of your eyes, or other visible expressions. Picture the person at the other end of the line. Talk to that person, not at the telephone. This way your voice will be less mechanical and deadpan. A moderate but lively tone of voice will show you are alert and interested. Let your voice be friendly and helpful, the voice of a smile, so to speak. Anyone can develop a pleasing telephone manner and an effective one for courtesy and thoughtfulness expressed in a clear and understandable tone of voice can create goodwill and win patience. It isn't difficult to achieve a voice that people listen to with pleasure. Many speak carelessly without realizing it. To speak distinctly, to be easily and accurately understood, just takes practice. The following three easy rules will help you to streamline your voice. First, be conscious of your speech always. Two, watch how others speak. And three, read aloud. Practice brings polish. Your voice is carried most clearly when you speak directly into the mouthpiece with your lips about half an inch away. It is also important to keep the receiver close to your ear. Shouting distorts voices. Whispering or mumbling hides your words. Your natural tone of voice is best when you speak directly into the mouthpiece. And watch your speed. If you talk a blue streak, you won't be well understood. You'll also waste valuable time repeating what you said. Drawl, and your words sound disconnected. The listener will lose the trend of your words, and he may lose interest too. 
Telephone speech should be neither too fast nor too slow. Speaking clearly will usually keep you from talking too fast. Always keep in mind that in the majority of cases you will be talking to people who are sick. Some will be in severe pain. Others will be frightened and apprehensive over a health condition. So these people will not be at their best, which makes it even more important that you speak so you can be easily understood. Now when the telephone rings, you should clear your mind, pick up the telephone, hold it properly, and speak distinctly. Dr. Parker's office, Miss Jones. It is no longer considered necessary to use time-consuming phrases such as good morning or good afternoon, Miss Jones speaking. It is assumed that the caller knows what time of day it is, and if Miss Jones is answering the telephone, then he can pretty well figure out that she is speaking. By giving your name, you become a real person qualified to help and not just a cold, nameless secretarial voice. A willingness to help can be shown by the rising inflection in your voice as a phrase is spoken again, Dr. Parker's office, Miss Jones. You should keep two things in mind as the conversation continues. You are not only representing the doctor in his profession, you are also preparing for future contact. Making appointments, calling the doctor to the telephone, or taking messages must be done with precision and clarity so that future action can be taken. And this first telephone conversation must assure the caller that he is in contact with an office that is willing and able to serve him. The caller will usually identify himself in the beginning. If he doesn't, you should say, may I ask who's calling, please? Never ask abruptly who's calling. Now is the time to get the correct pronunciation and spelling of the caller's name, too. It is always correct to clarify this in the beginning. For mispronouncing or misspelling a patient's name later can be embarrassing and indicate a lack of interest. A person never minds repeating his name for clarification and always make a practice of addressing the caller by his name once he has given it to you. If it is necessary for you to leave the line for 20 seconds or so, you may say, would you mind holding the line, Mr. Jones? However, if you must be gone for 60 seconds or more, explain the reason for the delay to the caller and ask if he would prefer waiting or would he prefer that you call him back. When you put the telephone down, never place it heavily on a hard surface. Placing the receiver gently on the desk pad will prevent jarring sounds from traveling the lines directly to the caller's ear. This is extremely annoying, you know. If the caller prefers to be called back, indicate the approximate time and then keep your promise. If the caller prefers to wait on the line and you are gone longer than you first indicated, return to the line and say, it should only be a moment more, Mr. Jones. Thank you for waiting. To be kept waiting on a silent line for long periods of time is the loneliest feeling in the world. When you return to the line after any absence, always make an introductory remark such as, thank you for your patience, Mr. Jones, or I have that information for you now, Mr. Jones. Thank you for waiting. We will discuss making appointments in greater detail in another record. However, when you are making appointments, always remember to make sure that you give the patient a choice of two times. For instance, 10 in the morning or 3 in the afternoon, something or something you will remember, never something or nothing. Make sure you understand which time the patient prefers, then repeat the agreed upon date and time. Clearly write the name and any other pertinent information in the appointment book. While making the appointment, Concentrate on getting enough information to take action and get it right. Learn the name well so you won't misspell or mispronounce it later. It is your responsibility to, one, determine what action is necessary, two, explain this to the caller, and three, take the action or see that it is taken. Be alert when a patient calls to cancel an appointment. Many patients are lost to chiropractic because the CA does not understand the importance or the procedure of following through to make certain another appointment time is set and kept. When a patient calls to tell you he won't be in for his appointment, you might say, I am certainly sorry to hear that, Mr. Jones, but I am sure it will cause no problem. Dr. Parker has several patients who would like to come in at that time. We certainly appreciate your calling, but now, since you are postponing, the next thing to do is to arrange another appointment for you right away. When will it be more convenient for you to come in, Wednesday or Friday? If the patient seems reluctant to set another time, or if he says he will call for an appointment later, Put a red X beside his name in the appointment book. He may not be planning to return, or he may be dissatisfied with the service rendered. In any event, leave the door open for the doctor to call if he wishes. To do this, you could say, I understand, Mr. Jones. I'm sure Dr. Parker will be interested in knowing how you are getting along and may want to call you. 
During the doctor's office hours, non-emergency telephone calls can be a problem. Calls from patients can involve the doctor in a succession of routine and often trivial discussions. So you, the well-trained CA, can be an invaluable asset to your doctor and his patients by screening these calls and by knowing what to do and say in situations such as this. An efficient CA may make all appointments and answer routine inquiries about chiropractic in general. This is discussed elsewhere in this album. Among the things you should not discuss with patients are matters relating to specific treatment, requests for changing the amount of the bill, and complaints about the doctor or other chiropractors. These topics should be handled by the doctor. When in doubt, you can always say, I'll ask Dr. Parker to call you, or I'll give Dr. Parker your message. And CA, never, never hold your hand over the mouthpiece while calling the doctor to the telephone or while talking to the doctor. This is one of the most often violated rules of proper telephone procedure. The caller can and does hear office sounds and your voice through your palm, and this causes a very negative feeling in the patient. And do not call anyone to the telephone in a loud voice. When the doctor is available for calls but is talking on another telephone, you should say, Dr. Parker is talking on another line. Would you like to wait, or shall I ask him to call you? If he is still talking after 30 or 40 seconds, return to the line and explain, I'm sorry, Dr. Parker is still on the telephone. Do you prefer to wait a little longer, or may I ask him to return your call when he is free? Always refer to the doctor by name. Dr. Parker is talking, and not just the doctor is talking. Or even worse, doctor is talking. And never say authoritatively, I'll have Dr. Parker call. Say instead, I'll ask Dr. Parker to call. If the incoming call is long distance, or if you feel it is urgent, write the information quickly on a slip of paper and place it before him on the desk so that he can decide what to do. When the doctor is occupied but wishes to speak to certain callers, be sure that he gives you the names of the expected callers. You may answer these calls with, Dr. Parker's with the patient, may I help you? This is Miss Jones, Dr. Parker's assistant. Or, Dr. Parker is not in the office at the moment, may I tell him who called? If it is someone to whom he wishes to speak, you might say suddenly, oh, here is Dr. Parker now. Or, if you'll hold the line a moment, I'll see if Dr. Parker can come to the telephone, Mrs. Jones. When the doctor is in but not available, it is best to be truthful and specific. Never say an abrupt, he's busy. The word busy could mean he is shining his shoes, reading the newspaper, or painting the back steps. Say instead, Dr. Parker's with a patient, or... Dr. Parker can't come to the telephone just now. May I know the nature of the call so that I can tell him? This is a non-committal expression that permits you to give the message to the doctor at once, tell the caller you will ask the doctor to call him later, or handle the situation yourself if it is possible for you to do so. This procedure tells the caller that the doctor is a busy man and being called to the telephone is often inconvenient. The CA should handle all calls whenever possible because she can refuse to answer inquiries about fees and she can praise the doctor in chiropractic with an emphasis that is not possible for the doctor himself to use. You should always repeat the patient's name and the doctor's name as often as possible. People love to hear the sound of their own names and repeating the doctor's name will imprint it upon the patient's mind. We suggest you don't say, the doctor is taking x-rays, for this may suggest that the caller will need x-rays also and may drive him away before you have had a chance to win him. When the doctor is out of town, use phrases such as Dr. Parker is attending a research seminar in Fort Worth, Texas or Dr. Parker is doing graduate work in Fort Worth, Texas. Giving such information indicates that the doctor is keeping abreast of developments in his profession. The word convention has assumed the connotations of vacation and dissipation to some people and should be avoided. When the doctor is in town but out of the office, make specific statements which convey the impression that his activities are purposeful. Dr. Parker had to make a call and will return about 3 o'clock. Or, Dr. Parker is attending a meeting and will be back in after lunch. Always avoid using incomplete and sometimes embarrassing statements such as, He hasn't come in yet this morning. Stayed up too late last night. Or, He isn't in. How abrupt can you be? Or, He's out for coffee. Goofing off, eh? Or, he didn't say where he was going. No organization in this office. Or, who's calling? Elizabeth Taylor, he's in. 
plain Jane. He can't be bothered. When an important call comes in while the doctor is out, it is wiser and more practical to have the doctor return the call rather than have the patient to call back. To be complete and accurate, messages should include the time the call was received, the name of the caller, including Mr., Miss, Mrs., Reverend, Doctor, etc., the telephone number and station number, the company name if appropriate, and any messages or facts given by the caller. If the name is unusual, ask the caller to spell it. Repeat it to verify it. Don't guess. Extra tact and courtesy are required when you have trouble understanding the caller. Never place the blame on the speaker by intimating he is speaking indistinctly or too fast. Say instead, we seem to have a bad connection. Would you mind speaking a little louder or slower, please? Show consideration for the patients in the reception room who hear your conversation. Your manner and your attitude will make an impression. Never discuss a caller with other patients. They will suspect you will do the same about them when they leave the room. When bringing the conversation to a close, courtesy permits the caller to close the conversation. When he says goodbye, answer with, Thank you for calling, Mr. Jones. Goodbye. Allow the caller to hang up first. If this is not practical, replace the receiver gently to prevent a jarring crash. If the caller continues talking after you have all the necessary information, a tactful statement such as, Then we shall see you at 10 a.m. on Friday, Mr. Jones, or I shall ask Dr. Parker to call you when he returns, Mr. Jones. We'll let him know you are ready to end the conversation. Leave the caller with the impression of your efficiency, service attitude, and your desire to help. To follow through after a call, remember to, one, make sure all necessary information is correctly recorded, two, deliver messages promptly, three, return calls at the agreed upon time, four, make notations if future appointments require a reminder call, and five, if the doctor is delayed in returning calls, advice of the delay will be appropriate and greatly appreciated. The basic design in all telephone procedure from the time the telephone rings until the dismissal of the patient is to proceed with words, gestures, movements, explanations, and statements that are completely within your own integrity. You know what chiropractic can do. You have seen it done. Never fear the unknown yourself by being afraid that something you may say today may boomerang tomorrow. And always bear it in mind that not only what you say, but the way you say it is of utmost importance. Don't ever be guilty of falling into the dungeon of gruffness, indifference, or sloppy speech. If you take the wrong attitude that Dr. Parker renders a good and needed service, so what's the use of all this silly charm and proper procedure? You can surely hurt your doctor's practice. Keep these cautions in mind always. One, guard against indifference. No one ever forgets a slight, and a patient who is slighted by not being greeted cordially enough or not having any time open for her appointment, is likely to brood over the matter and decide that she can get better service somewhere else. Two, watch your voice tones. It wasn't so much what she said as how she said it. You hear that phrase over and over as someone complains of the thoughtless handling of a situation. And three, never project an unfriendly attitude. A smile, a word or two of assurance, may be a friendly pat on the shoulder to one who may be present, a note of encouragement in the voice, such simple things may avoid the loss of goodwill in your doctor's patients, maybe even prevent the eventual loss of a patient. Helping your doctor build a successful practice can be one of the most rewarding things you will ever do. If indifference, carelessness, or neglect will lose friends, it will lose patients even faster. For patients are paying their hard-earned money for service, and service they expect, service they deserve. And that is why you are sitting at your desk. So never fail to practice good telephone manners any time you hold that instrument in your hand, at the office, at home, or even in a telephone booth. Perfect your telephone technique. Make it such a vital part of your personality that it even extends into your attitude towards people in general. A few years ago, one of the writers for Reader's Digest decided he would make a study of the most obvious bad telephone habits in our society today. He interviewed qualified experts such as Emily Post and Dale Carnegie, as well as thousands of secretaries, executives, office workers, and receptionists. He put the report 
of his survey in the form of questions. If you recognize any of the following eight bad habits in your own telephone technique, do something about it right away. One, do you fail to identify yourself immediately when answering the telephone or when telephoning someone else? Two, do you ever use such slovenly expressions as okie doke, you betcha, oak, or gotcha? Three, when you get the wrong number, do you hang up abruptly without apologizing? Four, do you put a caller through the third degree before yielding the information to which he is entitled? Five, do you make calls to people at mealtime on far from urgent matters? Six, do you begin talking a mile a minute without first asking the person if it is convenient for him to talk to you at that time? Seven, do you considerately ask to talk to someone or demand it by saying, let me talk to Joe Blow? And eight, do you hang up the receiver gently or slam it on the hook? America's 50 million telephones handle more than half a billion calls each day, and over half of these build ill will, not goodwill, say telephone authorities. Each time you use the telephone, you may win a patient for your doctor or lose him to chiropractic forever. Are you beginning to realize now just how important you are to your doctor's practice and what a tremendous responsibility your position represents? A truly competent chiropractic assistant can more than pay her salary just by following these correct procedures on the telephone. Always remember, a telephone is only as effective as the girl who uses it. So listen to this record until you perfect your telephone technique and just watch your doctor's practice grow.